Welcome back to the to the next last class of, of Revelation. You thought you got rid of me last week, but uh, thanks to Dee, I got roped back in. <laughs> so um, this is a uh, open question and answer time. You guys wanted to discuss the book or discuss chapters or verses or something like that, then um, this is the time to do that. Now, <clears throat> let me just kind of give a, a bit of an introduction here, then we'll open it up for questions, but... Um, if you remember, and we talked about this a bit last week, that the book is organized, Jesus himself organized the book into three sections, um, and that is the things which you have seen, that was John's encounter with Christ, then the things which are, those are the, that's chapters two and three, and that's the uh, seven letters to the seven churches, and then what we studied here and focused upon is the things which shall be hereafter and these are all still future events that will take place not one of these prophecies has been fulfilled and so our focal point has been on chapters 4 through 22 the um, this chapters 4 through 22 it's uh, there's a structure to this book and the structure to the book I call this the skeletal structure You'll also hear the terminology of narrative, um, the driving force of the book, the sequential part of the book are, are these things that are called judgments, followed by a 1,000 year period of time called the millennium. The judgments are broken up into three sections, and they happen in sequence, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls. The seventh seal opens the seven trumpets, the seventh trumpet opens the seven bowl judgments. And those happen over this seven year period of time. How do we know it's seven year period of time? Well, we know that from the book of Daniel. Remember, we went into the Old Testament in a lot of ways to try and piece things together, as well as we looked in Matthew and, and other parts of Scripture of, in, the, in the New Testament to try and piece things together to come up with this understanding of what this tribulation and millennium were all about. So that's, that's the skeletal structure and in sequence. But then to the skeleton, we add flesh to that. Things like a seven-headed dragon and things like the harlot and two prophets and the false prophet and 144,000 and a lot of others, right? So this other information down here um, that's called, in various terms, parenthetical information. Um, I, I use the term, and it confused some folks, and I, I had a question on that that was, that was asked. Like, uh, I use the term color commentary. And because someone said, what do you mean by color commentary? I can't find that in the Bible. Well, it, it's not in the Bible. It, I, I use that just as a way, as a teacher, to let you know that there are... Um, like a football game or even a newscast. You know, in a newscast you watch Fox News and, and uh, Brett Baer will give you sort of a play-by-play -play. this happened here, this happened here, this happened there, this happened here. And then at, toward the end he'll, he'll have a, a group of people, commentators, that will come in and they will discuss one or two or three of the events and really expand on those events to give you a, a really incredible big picture. And so that's what these things are at, at the, the bottom there is, is that's color commentary. One of the structures of, an, another way of looking at the structure of, these, of the, 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 the tribulation here with these scrolls is one through seven, the seventh seal opens the seven trumpets, which opens the seven bowls. But notice between six and seven of the chapters, that's where your color commentary comes in or your parenthetical information adding flesh to the bones, and, and that's what we see throughout. It's, uh, it's seven, it's heptatic is seven. From that, we wound up with this, and, and, and this is this timeline that we built all throughout the two years of study that we did to try and, and best understand, we tried to best understand how to piece all of the information of the narrative together, that is the, the, the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls, this stuff across the top, the seals, seal seven opens the seven trumpets, the seventh trumpet opens the bowl judgments, and where they might fit in on this seven year 
tribulation outline. All right. So this is the the timeline that we came up with, and I'll, I'll say, as I've said many times, there is no uh, sanctioned timeline. <laughs> you you'll be able to find different opinions of timelines based upon many many factors. One being what position do you take? Is it you know post trib, pre wrath, mid trib, pre trib? That will determine timelines. But even amongst groups like uh, of of the pre trib would come up with some, maybe something a little different than this. But uh, this is the best that that I could do to try and piece this thing together to give us an understanding of what this book is all about. Okay, so with that. Um, Let's open it up for questions, but uh, one of the questions that came up, I want to read some, uh, I want to deal with some of the written questions first that came in over the internet. Um, and thank you guys for writing these things in. One of the questions that came in is this, it, it, it's regarding uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18. And that is, I'll, I'll, I'll read it for you, the, the Lord will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet them in the air. That's the verse. And uh, this particular person said I, they were studying this in a devotional and had, was confused about it. And so the question was, are the dead in Christ that it's talking about people who have died? And then another question, what about the verse that somewhere else that talks about being dead but being present with the Lord. Does the soul go to heaven immediately at death but the physical body? If there is one, uh, some people get burned up in plane crashes or, or you know, in military, uh, they'll step on a landmine or something and there's no body parts. Or cremation. You know, huh? Or cremation. Or cremation, yeah. What happens to those people And so, if there's no physical body? Okay, so the answer to the question is, uh, who are the dead in Christ? Well, when a person uh, is saved and, and they are uh, in the church, they are considered to be in Christ. I in them and them in me. So the body of Christ, you, are, you are, as believers are in Christ. Those who die and have died on, while on this earth in the church are, are the dead in Christ. Their bodies are buried. Their, uh, their souls immediately go from being present uh, here on this earth to being present with the Lord. So absent from the body, the soul separates from the body, the body goes into the grave, and the soul goes into heaven to be with Christ. He immediate, he's immediately there and takes, takes them. All right. Then at a, some future point that we don't know of, which is called, called the rapture, that's when Christ will descend. That's what it's talking about here in, in 1 Thessalonians 4. He's going to, going to come to the clouds and going to call his church to come up. And then the dead in Christ, that is those who have died and who are buried, they will be resurrected first. There will be a physical bodily resurrection at that point. And, and they will rise first, followed by those of us who are still alive and to meet him in the clouds. So there will be this this lifting up that will take place, and all will, will come together. The bodies will be glorified. So, to answer one of the questions here, what about the, the bodies that are burned up, cremated, destroyed? Well, God is, is the omniscient one. He, he has tracked and can track every molecule that ever existed in, in this, this, this world, and will bring all of that together. That's what we're told. Now, how he does that, he doesn't explain it. We don't know the details of that. But we do know that our bodies will be made whole, rise, and then glorified. Uh, Paul says we don't know what we will be like, but we know we'll be like him. So our bodies will have, by being glorified, be somewhat like Christ's body. Now Christ was able to appear and disappear and walk um, amongst the, um, the, the apostles out of nowhere in a, in a closed room. Perhaps our bodies will have that ability. We just don't know. But that gives us something of an answer, I think, as to, to, to how this all comes together. If there's no physical body, that's God's business. He will raise that body up. There will be a raised body, and our bodies, if those of us who are still on this earth, we will follow after them. The Thessalonians were worried, but they asked this question, and this is what Paul was responding to. 
one of my um, family members died. They were believers. What, what, what will happen to them at the rapture? And that's when Paul says, don't worry about that. The dead in Christ will rise first, followed by those of us who are still alive. We'll, we will meet him in the air. Okay? Jeff. I think when he created Adam, it's a good, it's a good example. And from the dust. Okay. Yeah. Good. From dust you are, dust you'll return. And, uh, and so, yeah, God, God knows what to do with dust. We'll, we'll come back. So any, any other questions about that? That, that <coughs> can raise other questions. And, um, he, oh, here's a question. Uh, next question. When does 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18 take place on your timeline? Is that the same as when Jesus comes on a white horse with fire, killing the unsaved? Okay, on the timeline... I don't put it here, but the, the rapture takes place prior to the beginning of the tribulation. It takes place here, all right? And, and we don't know how much in advance of the beginning of the tribulation that the rapture takes place. Christ, when he returns, he's going to return in two ways, two methodologies. First, he's going to return in the clouds. He's not coming down to the earth. This is the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. He's, we'll, we will meet him in the clouds. The, the bride is taken and the bride is taken back home. That, the bride of Christ is the church. And that church is taken to a place that he, where he said, I will go and prepare a place for you. We talked about the wedding talk and about how the husband um, tells the wife that, that, the, that, that he's going to go away and prepare a place, but he's going to come again at some unexpected time and, and snatch his bride away and take her home. That's a picture of the rapture, where the church is lifted up and taken into heaven. All right? And so the second uh, part of his return is a physical return to the earth, and that return takes place here, the great and terrible day of the Lord. That's that literal day, that one day when he comes in and he returns, and that's when he meets the armies at Armageddon, and, and, and he defeats his army, and, and they are killed at that point. All right, so I think that answers those questions. Um, uh, one more she, that she had. Let me, let me say this, this last one here. On your timeline, it shows Satan permanently ejected from heaven. And I used uh, the trumpet judgment number six, where it talks about a, a star falling from the heavens, right, and came down with a key to open up the abyss. Well, that's, that star is, is Satan. And he opens up the abyss to let out the locusts, which become the sixth uh, trumpet judgment and, and a plague upon mankind. And so, um, and at that point, it appears he is permanently ejected from heaven. And so the question was, wait, I thought that, that uh, around the time of Adam and Eve, or right before that, that he was ejected. And the question is, is he still up there today? And the answer to that question is, uh, that's not his, his domain. His domain is the earth. Yet Satan has access to heaven. We know that. We know, we know that from Job chapter 1. Remember, God calls him up into heaven, to the throne room. And he says, what have you been doing? And, and Satan says, well, I've been roaming around uh, earth, going to and fro amongst the earth. So evidently, the, the, um, Satan and possibly the, some of the demons still have access to that. We know also that, that Satan... Um, it, stands before God and, and it accuses the brethren it talks about. Uh, that's in uh, Revelation uh, 12, maybe? Does anybody remember that one? Revelation 12? Let me look there real quick. He, where he... I hope I got the right one. Say it again. 12.10. 12, 10. Okay. And I heard a loud voice, Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, who accused them before our God day and night. The brethren, that's us, being accused day and night. So, you know, he's, he's up there. He's watching us as, as he... He watches us trip, maybe even helps us to trip, causes us to trip. 
And he said, ah, look at that guy, Rich Beattie over there. You know, the one who gets up in front of everybody. You know, and that guy, Steve Hudson, the one who gets up there and teaches, or that Pastor Eric. Look at what he's done today. He's your servant, you know. And so we're being accused day and night. But at some point, God gets his fill and says, that's it. You're out of here. Permanent ejection. And we see the this, this star falling from the skies. And I think at that point, that's the last go around. He's cast down. That's when all the demonic... Um, uh, all the demonic plagues start on the earth, the trumpet judgments, that's woe number one, woe number two, those trumpet judgments, that's the, uh, the, the locust and the 200 million horsemen that kill a third of the earth. Okay, so, what questions did I stir up there? John? Well, I'm going to kind of go back to the first question, which was about the, if I understood about, about when we die, yeah. it, you know, do we have some bodily form or do we just go and, and I thought about, I think about that question a lot myself sure. and uh, one thing that, I don't know if it confuses me or, you know, muddies the water or something is, you know, the Mount of Transfiguration, you know, we know we have, we know we have, um, I think Moses was one of them. Moses and Elijah. Moses had died and so he seems to appear in some sort of form, you see what I'm getting at? Yeah. Like, so what, so when we die, even if you're cremated, are we in, you know, what do you, what do you, are we in some kind of form, bodily form in some way? Yeah. You well, see what I'm saying? Yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, number one, the Old Testament saints won't be resurrected until after the church has been resurrected. We know that from Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. So Old Testament saints like Moses and so forth, their physical bodies won't be restored to them until... After, until after this point, before the millennium starts. Um, it's obvious from that, that situation in, in the Mount of Transfiguration that while we see uh, Moses and Elijah there, that, the, uh, that, that they were recognizable. I mean, immediately we, we see where the apostles said, that's Moses and that's Elijah. You know, it, how would they have known that? <laughs> how would they, they didn't wear signs or anything. How would they know what Moses looked like? You know, Moses happened, occurred hundreds of years before, um, before the apostles were on the earth. How would they know what he looked like? But so it appears that, that as spirits, our soul <laughs> spirits, when we go to heaven, um, those who have died in Christ and are there are recognizable to one another. But later, a, a physical body, <coughs> their physical body will be resurrected too. I don't know if that answers that question. That's the best I can piece yeah, that together. I, for I, you. I think so. Yeah, I guess I don't. I don't bring up Elijah because Elijah was raptured. Yes. So I mean, that would explain why he would. That would explain that. A, mm -hmm. a, 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 a quote unquote body or some yeah. physical form or mm -hmm. something, mm -hmm. but not. That, so I only bring up Moses because that's the one that I think. Right. Probably, but nobody saw Moses die. Yeah. yeah. No. Yeah. Nobody. Nobody in in Jesus' current day would have known who Moses. What he What he looked like. You know, they didn't take snapshots of him. You know, so they they wouldn't have known. But they recognized him right away. And that was my only point, is that from a spirit point. Steve? Yeah, when uh, the thief on the cross that, uh, that trusted Jesus and Jesus told him, uh, you're going to be with me today in paradise. Right. And so, so does that mean that it was his spirit vision at that he wasn't, his, his physical body wasn't going to get resurrected until later. Is that, right. Is that right? Yeah, he wasn't part of the church. Um, the church didn't begin until 50 days after the resurrection of Christ. So anybody that died before that period of time, as, as a group, as a body, will be, uh, as a total group, will be resurrected at the end of the tribulation. Jeff? You know, we hear all the time, you know, glorified body, yeah. new glorified body. Yeah. So um, we tend to think, okay, this is my body. No, it's going to be it's going to be different, even though in some ways it may be the same. But, yeah, I mean, that's all. All we know is is what Paul says is we will be changed. We'll all be changed. And he said and we will be eternal. Yeah, oh yeah, we'll be <coughs> eternal. You you will have an eternal body. It will it will never corrupt, never decay. You know, every every component part that's falling apart as we get older, those will all be restored and they'll be good for eternity. No more gray hair. Some of us will have hair. <laughs> Again. It seems you'll be able to recognize people. It, it appears you'll be able to, oh, sure, sure. So you must have something still. 
Yeah, well, I mean, you can even, it, it appears you can even recognize each other spiritually in heaven, right? We can see that with Moses, whose body had, has not yet been resurrected. So, so yeah, they, they recognized him. They knew him without even ever having known him so if previously. The, if the two uh, witnesses, All right. uh, when they come on, on the scene, the Jews, the Jews will recognize whether they are Elijah or Moses. Um, it, Whether it makes any difference to us or not. Well, um, let's see. The two witnesses, these guys, he has these two prophets that appear. We don't know by, by reading scripture whether this is Elijah and Moses, although they, they sure sound like they are by the, by, by the events that take place, by, by their ability to call down fire from heaven. Elijah did that with the false prophets of Baal. By the turning of the rivers of, of uh, water into blood, Moses did that. And so you look at these two guys and you say, boy, that sure fits. It sure seems that those are the, uh, those are the two. On the other hand, these may be two prophets that come in the power, spirit and power of, of, of Moses and Elijah. The same as John the Baptist came and, and, and uh, the question was to Jesus, well, I thought, I thought Elijah was going to precede the Messiah. And he said, well... If you, if you receive it, if you take it, John the Baptist fulfilled that role, all right, of, of the coming of the Elijah, the one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, and that's what he, he said, all right? So I, I, I don't know if we can specifically say, yes, that's Moses and that's Elijah, or that they come in that power and spirit and therefore... Well, what, what I was actually saying was the Jews who have studied this yeah. would know that, that if it was Elijah... Or Moses. Yeah. I, studying. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if they would know and how they would know that. John? If, if we stick to Old Testament saints not being resurrected or until after, wouldn't that kind of exclude it actually being Moses, one of the two witnesses? Yeah, you know, <laughs> I, I hate to put a box around things and say God can't do these things because just look at Elijah who he takes to heaven um, bodily. He took him physically, bodily. You know, so the, you, we come up with these principles and we try to explain everything underneath that. I don't know that, that I can draw that conclusion and say, well, God would never do that. Because, but we have general principles of what he's done and we follow that and that's the best that I think we can follow. Okay, any, any other questions on that? All right, let me get to another question here that... Uh, okay, um, here's one. The Antichrist. Is this person walking around on the earth right now? And why would Israel trust in this man to the point that they would be defenseless? Um, the answer to that question is, we don't know if the person is walking around right now. God is the one that's going to control when the Antichrist is presented on this earth. He's Satan's man, but it's only God who will say, I will allow that white horse rider to ride. The white horse rider is the Antichrist. And, and God is the one who's controlling that by breaking the seals, right? The seven seal scroll, the first seal that's broken is the white horse. What's the white horse rider? That's the guy that sits on the white horse. He's got a crown. And some people say, oh, that's got to be Jesus. No, he's the one with the bow with no arrow, and he's coming to conquer. He's a conqueror coming to conquer. And we know he's the first one. And we know at this point what kicks off the tribulation is the peace agreement, a seven-year deal that's cut between the Antichrist and Israel. And that's what kicks off the, the tribulation. So that's the white horse rider. Um, what was my question here? Oh, yeah. So, so, so God is the one that controls, controls when the seal is going to be broken, which determines when the white horse rider is going to ride. And I think we talked about before that, that Satan always has some man waiting, just on standby, that he's going to name as the Antichrist as soon as God gives the authority. To, that, okay, I'm breaking the first seal. Then he can say, raise that man up. Stalin may have been his man. Hitler may have been his man during World War II. Somebody else uh, will, be his, will have been his man during this period of time. We don't know who that is. Some, some maybe some person from Europe in that area, I think, is where, where he will come from. Yes, it's Soros. Huh? George Soros. A George Soros. 
Steve okay. Steve Steve writes that the question also was about why is it that the Jews would believe you? Yeah, yeah. The magazine that you gave us? Yes. I read it. Yeah, good. And one of the things that they said, the commentary was, that one of the, the one thing that the Jews really, really want is peace. Mm -hmm. They have been abused and exterminated and everything else, and this guy is going to come along and basically give them the one thing they have not been able to have yeah. for centuries, which was peace. Yeah. And they're buying in lock, stock, and barrel. Yeah. That's, that's, that's what happens. That's what happens. That's, that's exactly right. Remember peace and safety? Peace and safety? That's, that's what Paul said. That's when people are crying out for that and think they've got it, that's when the day of the Lord begins. Well, that's it right here. The, the day of the Lord starts at that point. This macro view that we talked about, this day of the Lord, that, that, that's when it will start. And it will continue on all the way through the end of the tribulation. And then the macro view, even the millennium, will, will include that. It was, some prophets say it's a day of darkness. Others say it's a day of darkness and light, the light being the millennium. Steve. And when you keep in mind the fact that Satan's a liar and the father of lies, he is the, the Antichrist is going to be all in the smooth talk of the politician. And so yeah. that, plus they, you know, the Jews want peace. And, and it's yeah. Understand. He's a real politician, huh? <laughs> yeah, but um, let, let me just finish up this one point. But um, the, the, this man, this Antichrist, is going to be a very, very powerful, influential man. For him to be able to step into that position and offer Israel peace, he would have to have international power to be able to even offer that, for, for Israel to buy into that to lower its defenses. One of the writers that I read said that this would likely happen after this Ezekiel 38-39 war, where Russia and, and the, um, some of these Arab armies will try and invade Israel, and some of their defenses may be knocked out as a result of that big bad war that takes place. They'll be saved from that, and possibly they, they will be defenseless anyway and looking for peace at all costs, and that's when he would step in and do that. Clay? Once the Antichrist signs that contract with the Jews, giving them peace, you can set your watch for how long all these other events. You sure can. And he would like to make sure that there's no recorded scripture anywhere in the world so nobody knows when that's happening. But if enough people remember or have record of what they're studying, yeah, yeah. The, every, the believers will know where everything's going to stop and yeah. start. Yeah, I think the believers will know. I think the believers, that's, I think that's one, going to be one of the great assurances of going through this miserable time is you'll know, know that there's a starting and a stopping point and you'll know what's coming next. I think that may help them to survive the seven, some of them, to survive the seven-year tribulation. When you look at all these judgments that takes, take place, the pollution, polluting of the rivers and the streams and the need for water and so forth, having read that, that they would know to gear up for those type of, of absences of those natural resources. Good. Anybody else on that? Okay, so Antichrist. Uh, the, the two witnesses, here's another written uh, question, question that was written. <clears throat> Are these two men prophets? Uh, the answer to that is yes, they're prophets. Why, why do we know that? Well, Scripture says they prophesy. He says, my two witnesses will prophesy. So they are prophets. Why do many, so many people think that these two are Elijah and Moses? I answered that with the, um, by the miracles that they perform. God's prophets uh, validated themselves with miracles in the Old Testament, and these will do the same thing with miracle signs and wonders, and they will be very, very powerful men. Remember that, that uh, they will be on this earth for 1,260 days um, this, to three and a half years, and after that they'll be killed. But they're going to be here for that time, and nobody's going to be able to touch them. And they will try to, men will try to kill them, but God protects them, and in fact, that anybody that tries to kill them, they get burned up uh, attempting to do that. But after this period of time, then uh, the Antichrist is allowed to kill them, and then they are... Uh, displayed out in the streets of Jerusalem, probably on CNN, nonstop for three and a half days, and suddenly they are raised. They just they ascend into heaven and are raised up. They're resurrected. And so one of the questions is, why do you think it makes more sense that these men appeared during the first half of the tribulation? Why would they come here? Because on some of these timelines, you'll see where they've got them starting here and going to the end. 
And I put them there. And they said, well, why did you put them there? Well, there were a couple of reasons that I put them there. Number one is God always sends uh, prophets to, to Israel before he judges Israel. Here's the great tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble that Jesus talked about. It's the second half of the tribulation. During the first half, they're protected by the Antichrist, right? And the second half is when it all breaks loose and then they're persecuted at that point. God has sent witnesses to let them know that they're, they're going to be judged. And I think that's, that's, their, that's their position all during that period of time. I also think that the two witnesses are, in, are absolutely involved in the saving of the 144,000 Jews. There's 144,000 Jews that we learned about, that these become the evangelical arm during that period of time. It's through these 144,000 that so many Gentiles are saved. Well, then you say, well, how do they get saved? Well, I can imagine that these two witnesses that they would, might recognize as Moses and Elijah would really stir them up and, and that they would come to know Christ through that period of time and therefore go out into the world. Richard, you have a question? No. Oh, I thought you were raising your hand. No. All right. Um, so anyway, those, oh, the other thing that, uh, there's a third reason why I put them there. It says that when they're killed, that there's this great celebration that takes place. All these people are, are all throughout the world that, that they are celebrating and they're giving presents to one another. Well, if, if the witnesses start here and they go 1,260 days, that's during the bowl judgments and everybody's running for cover that has survived, I guarantee it, during that period of time. Nobody's celebrating and sending presents during this period of time. So it made sense to me that that's, that's where that fits. But the 144,000, uh, a, a, uh, a testimony against Israel, witnessing uh, to Christ, and also the 144,000 that are saved as a result. Okay? All right, so the last written question I have is um, why does receiving the, the mark of the beast condemn a person, what, and what will this mark look like? Uh, the mark of the beast, I have an overhead that I've got for that. Hang on a second here. Uh, the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast, this number 666, what is that all about? Well, the number 666 is, is an allegory. That's, that's, uh, that means that the, the mark won't necessarily be three sixes on your arm or three sixes on your forehead. The number six is the number of man. Three, three sixes is a triune number. And remember, there's the unholy trinity, the uh, Satan, who stands as the father, the Antichrist, who stands as the son, and the false prophet, who stands as the Holy Spirit. And so when all three of these guys appear on the scene, um, and that's right at mid-tribulation, I'll go back to that timeline in a second, that's when everything starts. That's when that mark, it, it appears, that's when he's going to want to start controlling everything by having everyone be marked by this mark of the beast. The mark of the beast, is the, according to Scripture, is the mark that you will need in order to be able to get paid and, and use any type of services. They're going to have everything locked up, so to speak. You won't be able to go to Dunkin' Donuts and get a donut and a cup of coffee. They're not going to take cash. They're going to say, scan your hand right here, and you scan it, and, and it's charged to your account, and they also know who did it and when they did it and all that. Um, and that's going to be a worldwide <coughs> control mechanism. And as we discussed, if you remember, maybe last year when we talked about this, the, the technology for this exists today. It's, it's there right now. This can be done today. All right? that's, that's ongoing. And we also see the movement of consolidation of, of groups, of political groups taking place. Europe, for example, is one. Kathy, this morning, was talking about how uh, Macron, the, 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 the French president, is talking about forming up a European army <laughs> of all of Europe, a Euro army, right? So we're seeing the, this consolidation of things take place, the movement to a one world government, which is what will have to be done in order for one person to be able to control everything, and the mark is the vehicle to do that. Then the question is, well, why does receiving this mark condemn a person? Well, when it talks about this mark, it talks about the, 
the fact that those who will worship the beast will receive the mark. So it is a commitment of heart before the mark is placed. There's a, there's a heart mark, a mark inside, just like us, right? When we believe, that takes place first. You can wear all the trinkets you want around your neck with crosses and everything. That don't count. What really counts is what's inside. That's the same thing that, that, the, um, that will happen with the Antichrist, the false prophet, and Satan when he says, receive the mark, and they worship the beast. They worship that beast. That's their savior, and they will gladly receive it. On the forehand, or on the, uh, on the hand, or on the forehead, and some thought that I read about this was that the forehead mark may be those of the religious, <coughs> the priesthood of the Antichrist. They would be the more religious followers of him. It wears, but everyone will receive that mark. All right, so any, any questions about the, the mark of the beast? Okay, so now it's up to you guys. You have to shoot me some questions because I'm out of written questions. <laughs> if you have any questions about anything from chapter 4 to chapter 22, and I'll try and handle it. By the way, if I can't, if I can't answer your question, because it's a lot of stuff to try and remember, I'll write it up, and I'll, I'll have a, um, a handout over the internet, and I'll also bring some to class next week to pass out if I can't answer it. Yeah. I think I missed something. So you said Jesus Christ is coming twice, once in the clouds and once on earth, right? Yes. From the time he comes to clouds to the time he comes to earth, what is that difference? I mean, is it... Immediate? I mean, okay, let me go back to the timeline. Good question. Hang on a second. Let me get there and uh, get my timeline back up here. Okay, so um, he comes for the church here in the clouds. He comes to the earth here at the end. This time period, the seven-year time period, that the, the the church is taken up into heaven. Okay, the bride of Christ. The Bema Seat takes place. Remember that? We talked about the Bema Seat. What's the Bema Seat? The judgment seat of Christ where He judges the works of the saints. Not a judgment as to whether you're saved or not. You're saved because you, you'll have the robe of righteousness. You will have already had your resurrected body, all that stuff. But then He's going to judge the works that we do by the power of the Holy Spirit and those He hands out crowns as a result of that. That takes place. There's a, there's a wedding in heaven that takes place with the bride, his bride. And if you remember, we talked about the wedding, how the wedding was done with Israel, the Old Testament, how that was all done, and uh, where, where there's the contract with the, with the, the bride by the father of the bride and, and the, the groom and the father of the groom. Then they, they're married at that point, even though the, the groom and the bride don't physically consummate the marriage there. The groom then leaves to go with his father to build a place to add on to the father's house. And he tells her before he leaves, I'm going to go prepare a place for you that where I am you may also be. You know, and if I go, I'm surely going to return and receive you to myself. John chapter 17, so, uh, or 14. And so he, he goes and, and, and uh, he, does, he builds the house. And then at an unexpected time, he comes back and he grabs his bride and brings her to the house. They, go, they are married at that point, and they go into the bridal chamber for an extended period of time. And when they come out, he's going to return with her. There's a wedding feast. We talked about that. And that wedding feast will take place here. That wedding feast will include the groom, the bride, the church. It'll include the Old Testament saints. It'll include the, the tribulation saints. Uh, and it will include all of those who have made it through the... Um, uh, the, the resurrected tribulation saints and all those tribulation saints that have made it through a, alive and they will go into the millennial <laughs> kingdom with their natural bodies alive for that thousand year period of time. Okay. Luther. Steve, how long, how many weeks have you uh, taught this class? How many, I, I've been on two, two and a half years almost. No, but I mean <laughs> in, this, in this run here. You know, you've been teaching this class yeah. weekly yeah. for how long? Two, by, uh, off and on about two and a half years. <laughs> okay. And this is a question and answer session yes. on top of that. Yeah. Okay. Now, let me ask you a question. Okay. Let's suppose, let's assume you're at a social gathering or a business meeting mm -hmm. and you're talking to a non-believer mm -hmm. and he says to you, so Steve, 
tell me about this revelation stuff. Right. And and I got I got a meeting in about fifteen minutes. So what, what's this revelation stuff all about? Okay. How would you answer? Uh, first of all, I would say um, that uh, why don't we go have a cup of coffee? <laughs> But, but uh, no, I, I would say, that, and that's a good statement. What is this revelation stuff? What you're asking for is an encapsulated... Yeah, you, you, you're talking to a non-believer, and you've only got, <coughs> even if you got 30 minutes, yeah. even if you had an hour, I mean, after all this time, I mean, how would you okay. take it and try and answer this question? Yeah. I would say that, that revelation is a, it's a book that is the revelation of Jesus Christ, that it is the, the picture that we have of him that no other book describes. I mean, this is like no other book describes it. And it tells of, of him uh, as king, as lord, as, as the all-powerful one that, that is going to return at some point. He promised it, and this is the fulfillment of that promise. That's what the book is about. It speaks of all the end time events that have been prophesied that have not yet taken place. But we're all moving toward that direction. And if you have 15 minutes with coffee, I'll sit down with you and I'll describe exactly how that all fits together. But it's an amazing book that, that, uh, that we focus on as believers, as Christ as King, and as the fulfillment of prophecies that have been made from Genesis 1 all the way through the end of the book. You wouldn't mention anything about a death the soul goes to heaven and the body, so none of that stuff? No, no, I don't think I would mention that. I would talk to him about the amazing... No, I, I, think, I think what I would try and do would, would, would convey to him the amazing aspects of this book that just turned me on. <laughs> and, and let me tell you, if you have some time, I'd love to tell you about it, because they will, this will just light your eyes. And, and, and then I can get into detail. And then we can just talk. But, but generally speaking, it's the revelation of Christ as King. He's your Savior. He's the one who has said, I'm coming back. He's the one that rode the donkey and was beaten and bruised and bloodied and everything else. And he says, I'm coming back, but I'm coming back on a white horse. And I'm coming back for my church, and I'm coming back to fulfill everything I said I was going to do, and I'm going to do it. That's how I would answer that. Jeff? That 144,000 Jews are going to be preaching salvation from them all the way to the end, even in the Bay of tri Tribulation? Yes. They, They'll yeah, be protected. Yeah, they will be, 144,000 will be protected. We see them in chapter 7 being sealed at this point. Then in chapter uh, 14, I think, we see them in a, in a uh, victory celebration on Mount Zion with Christ. That they're, they're, they're there like, you know, the, this, the, they're marching in into, in to take over Jerusalem in a victory celebration. So they've made it all the way through. Yeah, they sure have. Can you imagine the impact that 144,000 little Apostle Pauls will make upon the earth? These zealot, these are zealot Jews who are un, uh, unmarried, have nothing to tie them down, being sent all over the world. <laughs> Look at, look at the impact one guy made, Paul, all over the world. And think of 144,000. You think God isn't gracious to do that? The grace that he pours out upon man during this last seven-year period of time? And that more people will be saved during the seven-year period of time than any other time in history. Than any other seven-year period of time in history. And that's what we see in chapter 7, where there's this great multitude of martyred people that have been taken out of the Great Tribulation. John says... Who are these guys? I don't, I don't recognize them. And, and the elder says, these are the ones that came out of the great tribulation. And, the, and these were the Gentiles that were saved and then martyred. And many, many, most will be, be martyred through that time. Jeff. Okay, the millennium. All right. Uh, we come back with God after, you know, Armageddon. Right. Know, we're with, in our new glorified body. We, what... Okay, Jesus will actually be on this earth. Yes. We will be like his helpers and, or what what is going to be his main purpose during this? because Satan is bound, he's bound. <coughs> right. So what is going to be Jesus' main purpose then during the thousand years? Well first the, 
Yeah, the, the first thing uh, of Christ's purpose is to fulfill prophecy. It, it has been prophesied that according to this uh, Davidic covenant that, that David's son will rule this earth. He'll rule with a, with a rod of iron. People still sit. You can still yeah. sit. During this thousand year period, he will sit on the throne in Jerusalem and Jerusalem will be the control point for all the world. All the nations will be subject to him. During that period of time, Okay, who enters the millennium? Let's talk about that. Who enters into the millennial kingdom? All the people. These guys will, 144,000. Those who have survived this will, will, will enter into it. The Jews, the remnant of the Jews, the, 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 the one-third that have survived, they will make it. Believers, believers will, will make it. Remember, there's going to be the separation of the sheep and the goats. Remember that? Christ is going to come back and there's going to be, he's going to separate all the people that have, that have lived and made it past Armageddon. He's going to now separate those into believers and unbelievers. The unbelievers will be killed, executed. Um, the same thing is going to happen to the Jews. We talked about, we looked at the parable of the ten virgins. Five had oil, five did not. The five who had oil, those are the virgins who were saved. The other ones, he said, I never knew you, didn't know who you were. And, uh, and they, will, they will not make it. So who makes it into the Millennial Kingdom with their natural bodies? Those people who are saved will have their natural bodies. They're the ones who will propagate the earth, physically do that. They will have offspring that will do that. These people that make it into the, to the Millennial Kingdom at that point with their natural bodies also have within them this thing called the Adamic nature, the sin nature, right? That's passed on to their kids and their grandkids, and, and, and they will populate. And remember that during that millennial period of time, death is an absolute exception rather than a rule. A thousand years. And so the, so the population will grow and grow and grow, and all during that time, even with Jesus present and Satan in, in, in the abyss, chained up, it says at the end, great multitudes rebel against Christ and seek to overthrow him. You know, And so there goes the excuse of Satan made me do it. No, no, that's mankind's rebellious nature. So many, 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 many of them are unsaved, and in the end, when, at their rebellion, they will be killed. Can I answer that? Good? All right. And what happens after that? Okay, at the end of the Millennial Kingdom, um, uh, then the next thing we see is, uh, is in chapter 21 and 22, is the new heaven. The, the heaven and the earth are destroyed. New Jerusalem comes down. It's, it's, it's the city made in heaven without, without hands. That's the, that, that is the, the house that Christ built for us. That's, that's, uh, that will come down. Jesus, uh, God will create a new heaven, a new earth. Um, some say it will be a brand new heaven. Some say it will be a, uh, the core of the earth will be there, but the entire surface will be changed, and our whole atmosphere will be changed. I don't know. That's all conjecture. But, but there will be a, um, uh, that's, that's where eternity begins at that point. That's where we, we, everything becomes anew. All tears are wiped away. There's no, no more anything of any kind of pain or suffering at all ever at that point forward. No more sin. Huh? And no more, no, no more sin, yeah. Only people that are believers with resurrected glorified bodies will be there. No more sin. Satan will have been, been cast into the lake of fire along with the, uh, um, everyone else. I, f I forgot to mention, too, at the end of this time, the great white throne of judgment takes place um, right after the end of the millennium. The great white throne of judgment, that's where all unbelievers are resurrected in, in, in I guess, their physical bodies, and they come before the great white throne, and that's when the books are opened. And uh, not a good time to... To, to, to be there. All sin will be exposed and God is going to judge them for their works. Clay. It's probably a real easy one. The beast and the antichrist, are they the same? Good question. Is the beast and the antichrist the same? And the answer is yes or no. Um, the, the term the beast, you have to read the context of, of what it's, in whatever uh, part of scripture that it's being discussed. The term beast can refer to this whole system, that, uh, this governmental system, this, this, the seven-headed dragon, seven heads, ten, uh, ten horns with ten crowns. That speaks of this, this 
this um, empire that is the seventh, actually the eighth empire that will take place. If you remember that, it's in chapter 17 when it speaks of the harlot. And so that's this governmental system that's based upon all of the evil that starts out with uh, Egypt, uh, Assyria, Egypt, and Babylon, and Medo-Persia, and Greece, and Rome, and then becomes the, the, the restored Roman Empire. That's the seventh of the heads. And then there's an eighth. The eighth is the final derivation, and that's when the Antichrist uh, kills or removes three of the, the, the kings and takes over, at world, uh, takes over world power and control at that point. Um, so if you're talking about the system, and, and it will describe it in some way, so he's, he's talking about the, the system there. Another time we'll talk about the beast and he'll be talking about the one with the mortal head wound. Well, the beast with the mortal head wound is the Antichrist. We know that he will receive what appears to be a mortal head wound and what appears to be a, will appear to be resurrected or will be physically resurrected if God gives Satan that ability. Does that answer? Thanks. Okay. Yeah. All right. See. Do you have any thoughts on the, how long it would be between the rapture and the start of the tribulation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we don't we don't know, but but I do have a thought on it, and that goes <coughs> into Second um, uh, Thessalonians, where it talks about that the uh, the rapture takes place, and then um, the the. That which, that which um, inhibits evil or inhibits the man of sin will be removed. Let the Holy Spirit be taken out. I, I take it that once the church is taken out and the Holy Spirit that resides in us is taken out, now he's still present, he's omnipresent, right? But he's not in believers and believers are not going to vo are not voting and not protesting and not doing whatever we do to hold back evil. Once that's out of the way, that sure gives the, the Antichrist a clear path. I don't see that as a great period of time between those two, but we don't know. I don't know. I can't say for a fact that it's a month or a year or ten years. So I, I, but most scholars that I've read think it's a short period of time. Dave. Last week you mentioned the Trump prophecy, but you didn't get a chance to talk about what is that. Okay, the Trump prophecies. Has anybody ever heard of those things? Okay, there's a guy that. Sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, my, my, my point in bringing that up is, is we were talking about some of the warnings that were in the epilogue in chapter 22 where it says don't add to the book and don't take away and beware of false prophets. And I wanted everyone to understand that there are people today that are declaring to themselves to be prophets and are, and are making statements, thus saith the Lord, the Spirit of God says this. And there's a guy out there that, that does that, and, and uh, he calls it the Trump prophecies. They, they say, he, well, he prophesied that, that in the 2012 election that, that Trump would take, take uh, uh, the presidency. And, and uh, well, he did. He did it in the 2016 election. And that's when everybody said, oh, he must be a prophet. And, and he said, yeah, I, I guess I, I misunderstood what God said. You know? so, so, he, he, so everybody now thinks he's this great prophet. Well, I looked him up the other day, after, right after the midterm elections, I said, well, I want to see what this guy prophesied about the midterm elections. And, and, and I got it. I found out on a, in a video that he said, well, the Lord showed me that this is not going to be a blue wave. In fact, it's going to be a red tsunami. And, and, that, and that it's all going to be red, right? That the, well, it turns out he's wrong. Well, a prophet of God is, is never, wrong. never wrong. Zero wrong. They don't have a 90% average or 95 or even 99. One, one wrong statement about thus saith the Lord. What'd you call it? Rock concert? Rock and sleep. Right, yeah, rock concert. You know, they, they stone them to death, right? And so, and so my point is, is that, is that just beware that there are false prophets around even today. And a lot of these guys that are on TV and, and making all these promises of God of pouring out the, the wealth and prosperity gospel that Eric spoke about, False, 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 false stuff, right? So that's where I was coming from. Got, Lauren. Since you brought it up, I wasn't going to ask you because I don't want to embarrass my wife. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm always, okay, in church we always hear that the pastors, you know, they say there's false prophets and the Bible says don't add to this because it's in Revelation. My question is, I'm reading in a Revelation where it says don't add to this book, and I'm wondering, people say because Revelation says don't add to the book, it's don't add to the Bible, but when I look at it, I'm just curious if Revelation is not a book standing by itself, 
for John wrote, he said, you know, and this book, because the plagues will be on you if you do so. And if it was the Bible, most of the Bible doesn't talk about plagues, plagues, plagues. So I take this to be the book of Revelation, talking about we can apply it to the Bible. Don't they say the Bible says, don't, <coughs> I feel like it's talking about the book of Revelation. Don't add to this book, singular as opposed to books of the Bible. Well, I, I think what you, you kind of answered your own question there, and, and I think what you said is correct. It, it is the writing that uh, of the book of Revelation, but the application is for the entire word of God. Okay, so uh, it, the application is, sure, sure. Um, Malachi, and I don't have the top, off the top of my head, I think it's Malachi that speaks of don't add to the closed book of the Old Testament, right? So, so the principle is, is anybody that says, thus saith the Lord, you know, and, and tries to... To, to, to add to this book, which is the, uh, the, the verbal revelation of God to man, and tries to add to that, there is no new verbal revelation to man. There isn't. After this book was written, it is a closed book. There's no new verbal revelation given to man. No reason for that. The next time we will see a prophet come on, on the scene, after this book was closed, is the two prophets. That's when they will come. Steve, Rich. What would be the one thing that you would tell somebody, the difference between pre, mid, and post-tribulation? What is the one interpretation, and I know we're trying to squeeze a lot of things into a quick answer, yeah. but what would be the one thing that people choose to interpret that would make them a pre, post, and mid? Well, generally speaking, um, that's a good question. Um, the pre uh, Pre, mid, post, and pre wrath. Pre wrath is sort of a, a, a derivation of the mid tribulation uh, position. The one thing that separates pre trib from anything else is the imminent return of Christ. You cannot have an imminent return of Christ if you believe in the mid, pre wrath, or post tribulation rapture positions. And that's what separates the pre tribulation rapture. And, if, and as we, you weren't here last week, I don't think. Well, last week we really focused in on the last uh, 16 verses of chapter 22 and that is just chock full of the imminent return of Christ where he says I'm coming quickly he says it three times Jesus says that to the church the last words of him the, his, his last words to the church is I am coming quickly all right and in that term quickly is an anticipation it's one of those anticipation words that's not time bound and I, and I, I described how um, the, the time is always up to the speaker on those type of words. All right. So, so I would say the imminent return of Christ is the the one thing that separates those positions. Right. Anybody else? I got three more minutes. No questions. The horses. The horses. The white horse. The red horse. Yeah. The black. There's a green horse. A uh, pale horse. Yeah, yeah, you can call it a, a kind of a pale green horse. Death. What the skin looks like at death. Well, the black horse was death. The black horse is famine and uh, economic collapse. Okay. And the red horse is... Armageddon. World War Three. Red horse right here. White horse, red horse, and then a, probably about around this time is where the pale horse comes in and that's one, one fourth of the population dies. Can you imagine that? 1.8 billion people will die. Another 1.8 billion people will die here. A lot of death. And one more thing. Okay. 144,000 Jews yes. going into the millennium. Yes. Are they, what are they going to be doing then? Still preaching? I bet you they'll get married and probably have a whole bunch of kids. <laughs> <laughs> they were single for seven years. <laughs> I don't know, but I'm, that's what I'd do if I was one. Maybe they'll retire when they Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, one more. Believers that refuse to accept the mark of the beast during the yes. all that, are they just going to have to kind of go underground and try to survive until yeah. they go to, to, to the end? Yeah. Most of them will be probably executed. Most of them will be executed. Yes, they will refuse to receive it, probably be arrested and and executed. Beheading is what they what, they, what Scripture talks about. They'll be, be beheaded. You know, it was so interesting when, when we, if you read this 10 years ago, you say, beheading, who does that anymore? 
<laughs> Look at ISIS. <laughs> yeah, a terror weapon. Okay? We good? All right. Well, thanks once again. And, uh, <laughs> Clay, can you close us for in prayer, please? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for Steve putting all this time, a little over two years, into this series. And uh, and your word, as you say in the beginning of Revelation, blessed is he who reads words of this book. Uh, thank you for the blessings that you give us for studying this book, and pray we be well prepared uh, for <clears throat> the days to come, whether we see this or not but that others might know uh, what this is even when we tell them to them. I uh, pray that many can even come to know Christ through knowing what goes on in Revelation. I've heard of enough people come to know him that way before. ask your blessing on this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.